The Chinese Super League has sought to present itself as the great emerging power within the world of football over the last four or five years, just as China itself has become the world's great emerging power over the last four or five decades. One of the teams at the forefront of this footballing great leap forward has been Jiangsu Suning FC, backed by one of the powerhouses of China's enormous retail industry, who also own current Serie A league leaders in Milan. Ranked as China's fourth wealthiest club by Forbes, Jiangsu won promotion to China's top flight for the first time during the professional era in 2008, and they haven't been relegated since. Having won the Chinese FA Cup in 2015, the club got their hands on the most prestigious trophy of the lot, the Chinese Super League title, for the first time less than three months ago, defeating eight-time Chinese Super League champions Guangzhou Evergrande across a two-legged playoff final in front of a limited crowd in Suchao. The scorer of what proved to be Jiangsu's winning goal was one Alex Teixeira, perhaps the most landmark Chinese Super League signing to date. There had been many big money arrivals to the Chinese Super League before Teixeira joined Jiangsu in 2016, Robinho, Paulinho and Tim Cahill to name a few, but they were all to a certain extent on the decline. Teixeira most certainly was not, having just enjoyed an awe-inspiring half-season at Shakhtar Donetsk, where he had bagged 22 goals in 15 league games at the halfway stage in the 2015-16 campaign. There was concrete interest from Liverpool, under new boss Jurgen Klopp, who had lodged an official bid, yet Teixeira chose to join Jiangsu instead. His 15 million euro arrival briefly made him the league's most expensive signing, breaking the record for the third time in just 10 days but it isn't the only occasion in which Jiangsu Suning splashed the cash. Alongside Teixeira, the club signed his compatriots Ramirez from Chelsea and former Man City striker Joe. The later appointed former England boss Fabio Capello, and in 2019, they came mightily close to securing the signature of Gareth Bale in a move from Real Madrid. It would be fair to say that for the last few years at least, Jiangsu haven't messed about when it comes to their finances, and their maiden league title in 2020 seemed like their crowning achievement. You could say that it came as a surprise then, just a few days ago, when the club put out a post on WeChat, China's largest app, which functions like a combination of WhatsApp and Facebook, stating that they had seized all operations. That includes Jiangsu Suning Ladies Football Club, who are themselves two-time Chinese Women's Super League champions, as well as the Men's Club. And yet, to those who are familiar with the inner workings of China's tumultuous top flight and the government's rocky relationship with the world's most popular sport, this news is somehow simultaneously shocking, but not at all surprising. China's footballing project goes far beyond Jiangsu Suning, and so too does China's footballing crisis, which is the subject of today's video. So forget about football in Europe or the Americas for a moment, switch off from any existential dread surrounding the state of the planet, and join me on a journey exploring the chaos surrounding the machinations of the beautiful game in a country where this website is banned. In 2014, Chinese President Xi Jinping set out his government's three-point plan for Chinese football. They did so in the form of a series of policy papers, but the three targets outlined by China's new leader were for China to have 300 million children playing football regularly by 2020, that's almost six times the total population of England right there, which they managed to achieve. The next step is to have a Chinese national team which is on par with East Asia's current powerhouses of South Korea and Japan by 2030. So, a team that can regularly qualify for the World Cup Finals. And lastly, for China to become one of world football's ultimate superpowers by 2050. Good enough to beat any other national team and competing to win the World Cup. The Chinese Super League was to become a central pillar of these plans, with a strong domestic top flight considered to be integral in growing the popularity of the sport, promoting investment, and creating a clear pathway for China's future generation of footballers into a competitive league. In the year before Xi Jinping came to power, 2011, almost no one outside of Asia had any reason to know anything about Chinese football. It was a country where teams sometimes went on pre-season tours. That was about it. Though the league did have foreign players pre-2012, few were big names, and even in China itself, the league was best associated with scandal and corruption rather than footballing prowess. China got its first major professional football league in 1994, the GAA League, which just so happened to coincide with the introduction of the five-day working week and increased time and resources for weekend leisure activities among the nation's city-dwelling growing middle classes. You see, football has always been popular in China. 
The ancient Chinese game of Kuju is often cited as the earliest form of association football and was recognised as such by disgraced former FIFA president Sepp Blatter. Football in its codified modern day form would arrive in China a few thousand years later via Britain, but China were at one time Asia's strongest national team. Before China's communist revolution, civil war, and the ascent of power of Chairman Mao, China were East Asian powerhouses. Particularly during the 1920s, considered to be the nation's golden era, China dominated the football discipline at the Far Eastern Games, spearheaded by Li Wei Tong, a native of British Hong Kong who is considered to be one of the finest Asian footballers of all time to this day. Following the success of the CCP in taking control of China though, or post-World War II, depending upon how you wish to frame it, China has consistently been one of world football's great underachievers. There is a common complaint among football fans in China, represented by the slogan, 11 from 1.3 billion, begging the question of how a nation of so many, who care about football so much, can consistently be so useless when it comes to the sport. Every leader of the CCP since Mao, and including the revolutionary, who actually played football himself as a goalkeeper during his college days, has sought to rectify this anomaly. China has become the dominant force at the Olympic Games, but they have only ever qualified for one World Cup, in 2002, where they lost every game and failed to score a single goal. The GIA A League made a bright start, sponsored by Malbra, the cigarette brand, for the first five years of its existence, and attracting an average attendance of over 17,000 fans in the league's first season. By the early 2000s, the league was faltering though, and support was dwindling. China's FA did away with the GIA A League and launched the Chinese Super League in 2004, but the switch-up failed to have the desired impact. Interest in the league diminished following the relaunch, and foreign and domestic audiences largely considered the league to be something of a farce. Corruption is a long-standing issue in China, and the nation's new league was thought to be riddled with it. There were allegations of illegal betting and match-fixing, frequent instances of violence among the small number of supporters who still attended games, and instances of racism towards foreign players, and particularly towards black players. In many respects, this was the state of play when Xi Jinping became China's new dictator. Immediately, changes were made. You may recall that it was in 2012, the year Xi took office, that the likes of Didier Drogba and Nicholas Anelka signed for Chinese Super League outfit Shanghai Shenhua, Drogba signing fresh off the back of just having won the UEFA Champions League with Chelsea. They weren't the only ones though, there was also Frederick Canute, Yakubu, and World Cup winning manager Marcello Lippi, among others. Meanwhile, Dario Conker's arrival at Guangzhou Evergrande was said to put him among the 20 highest paid footballers on the entire planet. It is a trend which has continued ever since, accelerated by the CCP's plans outlined in 2014, which came in light of some of China's worst international performances yet. In the men's game, I should clarify. China failed to qualify for the 2014 World Cup, and that was followed by a humiliating 5-1 defeat to a very young Thailand team in 2013. That defeat prompted considerable anger among supporters, which spilt over into riots in the streets and caused for the Chinese FA's president to resign. They got their wish, as Yun Weiman was eventually booted out and replaced by former table tennis player Chai Zhenhua. Results didn't improve though. In 2016, supporters took to the streets once again after the national team lost 1-0 to war-torn Syria in a 2018 World Cup qualifier. The Syria team weren't even able to train or play in Syria at the time due to the country's ongoing civil war. Clearly, this was a challenge of epic proportions. Xi Jinping is a man with epic resources and power at his disposal though. A valid claim could be made for Xi being the most powerful individual on the planet, as evidenced by the recent disappearance of Alibaba founder Jack Ma for a number of months before he was shown in a clip from China's state media following the tech entrepreneur having made a number of critical comments about the CCP. Ma is the third richest person in China and the 20th richest person in the world. If he can be silenced, anyone can. So when Xi Jinping said he wanted to see investment in football, he got it, and not just from the state. Following the outlining of Xi's plans in 2014, some of China's wealthiest individuals and companies began pouring their money into football at home and abroad. Jack Ma's own business, Alibaba, owns 40% of the CSL's most successful club, Guangzhou Evergrande, now known simply as Guangzhou. Real estate giants Greenland Group owns Shanghai Shenhua, the Sinabo Group owns Beijing Guan, and Dalian Wonder Group owns Dalian Pro. I could really go on. Overseas, we have seen a wave of Chinese cash flood into European clubs. 
Three Premier League teams, Southampton, West Bromwich Albion and Wolverhampton Wanderers, are all majority owned by Chinese businesses or billionaires. Meanwhile, Chinese investment company Citic Group acquired a 14% stake in Manchester City in 2015 which prompted Xi Jinping to pay the club a visit that same year whilst on a state visit to the United Kingdom. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that perhaps not all of these billionaires are passionate about football, and that some of them may just be courting favour with Xi. In fact, it has even been theorised that Xi's own love of the sport may just be a facade. Football is the global sport, and is reportedly seen by the CCP as a gateway into foreign markets, a potential source of national pride, a platform to build a wider sports, leisure and entertainment industry around for China's growing middle class, and a way for China to earn greater international recognition and respect. Whether Xi's love of the game is genuine or not, all of these factors are likely to have played a key role in the prioritising of the sport over numerous other issues. However, cracks are emerging in Xi's plan. Which brings us back to Jiangsu Suning, who actually renamed themselves as just Jiangsu shortly before the revelations emerged. Jiangsu are, or were, owned by Suning Appliance Group, who are 20% shareholders of Suning.com Limited. Suning.com is one of China's largest retailers with over 20 billion US dollars in annual revenue. And following their success in the retail space, the company branched out into one or two other businesses like streaming and marketing. Now they are looking to strip back from other industries though, having just sold 23% of their assets, which the company says is a long-term strategy so they are able to maintain a laser-like focus on their core retail business. Ending their investment in Jiangsu FC and the club's associated women's team is thought to be part of this streamlining, and having tried to find an investor for six months, Suning Appliance Group finally pulled the plug just a few days ago, and the teams seized all operations. But why would one of China's largest companies, and one of China's wealthiest individuals, who is a former politician himself, have wanted out of a team that just won the Chinese Super League? And why wasn't there another business or billionaire just waiting to step in and fulfil a lifelong dream of owning a football club? Or at least, trying to court favour with China's supreme leader? Well, one reason might be that owning a Chinese football club isn't a very profitable business. In order to attract players, clubs have had to offer foreign players eye-watering contracts whilst revenues haven't risen as hoped. As of the end of last season, 11 of the world's 30 highest paid footballers played their club football in China, each earning between £280,000 and £575,000 a week. No Premier League player comes close to earning as much as the likes of Oscar, Hulk and Paulinho reportedly do. Yet the league's total revenue remains dwarfed by the Premier League and is roughly on par with the championship, meanwhile average attendance is peaked back in 2016. There are one or two suggestions that Xi and the CCP are already scaling back investment in football, having been disappointed by the lack of impact that they have seen since outlining those initial plans in 2014. If Xi starts to lose interest, then so too will China's businesses and billionaires, many of whom likely never had the growth of football in China as their main priority. This could have significant knock-on effects for football worldwide, and in some respects, it already has. Suning.com, the company Jiangsu's former owners were shareholders of, also owned PPTV, a streaming service, who have the rights to broadcast the Chinese Super League, the UEFA Champions League, the Bundesliga, and more in China. PPTV also previously had the rights to broadcast the Premier League in China, in a deal worth more than £500 million on an annual basis. That made it the Premier League's most lucrative overseas TV deal, but in September, the Premier League pulled the plug on PPTV's rights to broadcast over an unpaid £160 million payment. Given the struggles with Covid, the loss of this income came as a significant blow to Premier League teams. PPTV also ended their broadcasting agreement with La Liga in 2020 and suspended broadcasting of both the FA Cup and even Serie A in February 2021. I say even Syria, because Suning.com also sort of, kind of, own Inter Milan, who currently top the Syria table. Inter are owned by Suning Holdings Group, which belongs to Suning.com founder and the company's largest shareholder, Zhang Jingdong, though Suning Holdings Group is technically a separate entity to Suning.com and is the private investment arm of Jingdong's business. The likes of Southampton and West Brom, both Chinese-owned, have scaled back spending in recent years, and to a lesser extent, so too have Wolves, particularly in terms of their plans surrounding the redevelopment of Molyneux. There is not yet any suggestion that Suning will pull all funding from Inter, as they have done with Jingsu, 
that would be pretty reckless given that Inter are currently top of the Serie A table and have significant commercial potential in their own right, regardless of Xi's updated outlook on football. Though Su Ning have been seeking external investment in the club for the last six months. It is a precarious situation, both at home and abroad, for Chinese-owned football clubs. One Chinese Super League team was dissolved in 2020, and there are already two who have bitten the dust in 2021 prior to the start of next season, including the reigning league champions. Inside China, the league still has a reputation for corruption, and the quality of China's domestic players has barely improved. Outside China, players are likely to start treating a move to the Chinese Super League with even more suspicion if they cannot be sure that contract promises will be fulfilled and that owners are in it for the long haul. The fallout of all this is really yet to develop though. Whether Xi and the CCP have really given up on football, or at least to what extent, remains to be seen. China's president may not have to answer at the ballot box, he is in essence a president for life should he wish, but he still wants to be popular. The CCP have tied themselves to China's footballing project in a fashion that is difficult to reverse. They announced their 2014 targets with such bravado that football-loving Chinese citizens are holding them to them as promises. The bond is so strong that when China's national team fails, fans blame politicians and Xi as much, if not more, than they blame the managers or players, who are written off as simply not being good enough, rather than actively having done anything wrong. In many respects, then, I have made this video at what is likely to be a seminal moment in the history of the Chinese game. Right now, the league appears to be in chaos. I haven't even had time to mention Shandong Luneng getting kicked out of the Asian Champions League, and there appears to be a real threat of state, individual, and businesses all pulling their investment from football clubs at home and abroad. But on the flip side, failure to see through his plans, or at least be perceived to have done so, would be politically very damaging to a man who doesn't like to be disliked. So watch this space, because the next 12 months may determine whether China are world champions by 2050, or whether they're still losing to Syria, Uzbekistan, and Iraq. Thank you all for watching today's video. Before I leave you, I just wanted to tell you about Zheng Ji, who made his debut for China during the same year in which the country qualified for their only World Cup in 2002. You may remember Ji from his time in Britain, where he played for Charlton Athletic and Celtic. Here he is with then Prime Minister Gordon Brown and Manchester United player Dong Fang Zhu back in 2008. Well, Xi is now 40 years old, and he still captains China's biggest club, Guangzhou, and he is still a full international. I'm not sure whether that says more about the state of the Chinese Super League and the Chinese national team, or about the longevity of the former championship midfielder. I suspect it is a bit of both, but I just found that quite interesting, so I thought I'd share it with all of you. Thank you as ever for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's video, whether you're watching via a VPN in China or elsewhere. Go ahead and hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. Feel free to let me know your thoughts down below in the comments and make sure to subscribe to HITC7s and click the little notification bell to ensure that you never miss an upload. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s should you wish to do so.